Knowing your anatomy is what's really going to put you ahead of the rest when you're talking about cranial sacral therapy and knowledge of the cranial nerves, what bones they actually pass through, which nerves communicate with other nerves is really going to help you when you're talking about people that come in with traumatic brain injury. Maybe they've had a seizure. I treat a lot of kids that have head trauma or um, birth trauma and knowing what their symptoms are based off these cranial nerves is what's going to help you in the long run. So I've tried to do each one a different color, but you could see how olfactory has a very short pathway, but because of sense of smell is integrated with a lot of your senses, this guy is going to be involved with other nerves. You can also see that all of these nerves that feed the eye all pass through the sphenoid. So if you have someone coming in with things like double vision, difficulty with accommodation with um, distance versus uh, proximal, eye tracking position, nystagmus, sphenoid is gonna be a huge bone that you're gonna go look at and potentially treat to help them with some of that eye dysfunction. If you look inside the skull, there's this bone called the petrous ridge and that is part of the temporal bone. The petrous ridge is what houses the inner ear. But the cool thing about this temporal bone is there are nerves, these cranial nerves that actually attach to or pass over this petrous ridge that have nothing to do with the inner ear. So you may be treating a lot of temporal bone, but it has nothing to do with the inner ear. They all come off of the brainstem except for olfactory and um, ocular. This ocular nerve, you have to remember that it causates, it crosses, so that it uses input from both eyes and actually crosses and then comes back to the posterior skull. So they may have an impact on the right side of the right side of the head, but they're having all left eye symptoms. So again, knowing your anatomy is going to be a huge big bang for your buck. Another really important piece I think is the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is, is huge. It's um, in three branches, V1, V2, and V3. So it innervates the face, um, V1, V2, V3. But V2 has an extra branch. It's called the meningeal branch. That actually comes way down inside of the skull and innervates the meninges. So if you have someone that comes in that's complaining of a cranial base headache, um, most people that have come in and have had an issue with that, they actually say their brain hurts, they have a brain ache. That's that meningeal branch is being compromised somewhere along its track. There's also a ring that's inside of the orbit that holds all of your cranial nerves, it keeps them in a nice tight bundle except for abducens. So abducens is actually the longest cranial nerve within the cranium and it can give you a lot of issues with being cross-eyed, nystagmus. So knowing that that nerve is separate from the rest of the eye nerves could be important. And then if you look at the bottom of the skull where you've got facial nerve exits really close to this mastoid process, what's this big huge muscle that passes right in front of it? Your SCM. So if you have a client who has whiplash, who threw their neck out and their SCM is big, tight, and angry, you could be having some facial nerve dysfunction. The last big piece would be jugular frame, and we talked about that earlier with the blood return up that vessel. But we're talking about access accessory motor, vagal, and hypoglossal. They all exit um, at that, that point. So if your client had a whiplash type injury, they're having difficulty swallowing, they've got neck pain, they've got indigestion, they've got heart palpitations. This is a huge area to be treated, not only because those nerves are giving you symptoms, but especially vagal nerve because it's the wandering nerve, it's the longest nerve. It feeds the majority of your visceral structures, your heart, lung, helps with blood pressure, all kinds of, of, of gut pathology. It's actually the gut brain connection, meaning that, that that nerve actually comes all the way down to just below or above your belly button with no synapsis, meaning that it's actually your brain in your gut. So working and desensitizing some of that distal vagal position might be really important when you're talking about this area. You can also see how trigeminal nerve exit at the hard palate. 
a lot of trigeminal neuralgia. I treat quite a bit of that. And then the V3 branch would come down and innervate the jaw. So going through each individual nerve and giving you specific bones that would be involved with that nerve and maybe some pathology. So if we're talking about olfactory, it comes off the brain to these bulbs that sit on top of the ethmoid. And it's not, think of it like a toothbrush sitting on top of the ethmoid and the bristles come through the ethmoid into the nose. And that's where the magic happens with the olfactory bulb. But you're talking about being able to treat ethmoid, frontal bone, sphenoid, because ethmoid is attached to the sphenoid, and also vomer, which is that triangle-shaped bone that comes off um, forward and actually attaches to the hard palate. Next, we're going to talk about optic. This is this green wire, and I've, you can see how there's a light green and a dark green showing left and right eye, and that field of vision, how it causates, and will actually go into this heart-shaped pattern into the back of the skull. Mostly you're talking about sphenoid, as this big huge nerve passes through this upper foramen of the sphenoid and into the eye. You would also want to check the, all eight bones of the orbit, because that would affect not only sphenoid position, but also the position of the eyeball. Vision integrates 80% of the brain. So later we're gonna talk about retained primitive nerve reflexes, and that would be a huge indicator um, for not only that modality, but if you're talking about eye tracking, being able to focus, you are gonna be integrating more pieces of the brain just by fixing one cranial nerve because of how that nerve integrates the whole brain. It's also associated with pearl, with the ocular motor nerve, circadian rhythm, and uh, orientation to a, the, your environment like a head turn. So if someone sh sneaks up behind you and scares you, that ocular nerve is hot. Next, we're gonna talk about ocular motor, which is this blue nerve. You can see how much it branches out around the eyeball. It's feeding all of those muscles except for abducens. It's responsible for pearl. So pearl is that, that pupillary reaction. Those eye muscles, your eyelid, the lens position. So how it's a focusing with accommodation. Accommodation is a hard thing to diagnose, especially when you're talking about kids. So are they tilting their head to, to focus rather than the lens accommodating? So looking especially at children when they come in for treatment, are they, do they have their head tilted to one side to look at you? Next, we're gonna talk about trochlear nerve. Um, it passes through the sphenoid and the tentorium. So trochlear nerve, it also does, um, does the oblique muscle within the, the eye, and it does not pass through that tendinous ring. They will tend to look down uh, when reading, and they have difficulty walking downstairs because of the eye position. Trigeminal, uh, we're, we're gonna briefly go over trigeminal. You could spend an entire course on trigeminal because it has the three branches, but mostly looking at the areas that it passes through. Your Meckel's cave is this um, hollow area um, right here. It's, it's fibrous, it has a lot of that fascial material. Um, it passes, it pierces through that Meckel's cave. The petrous ridge, which we talked about, is this piece that holds the inner ear. It actually makes a, a fibrous attachment there. So it passes through the sphenoid in three areas. So you could see how it passes through here. And if you tilt it up, you can see how it comes out here by the hard palate, and then there's a third foramen down here at the bottom of sphenoid where it go down to the jaw. It innervates the teeth, the lacrimal gland, part of the lacrimal gland. Um, the temporal bone, we talked about this meningeal branch off of V2 that comes down and innervates the meninges. It's that brain ache sensation. Uh, it does the muscles of mastication. Um, the, um, muscles of the ear, the soft palate, the floor of the mouth, the nasal mucosa, so that's um, part of um, getting a runny nose or when your lacrimal, lacrimal gland is really going. It does all your submandibular glands, but if you can remember, V1 feeds the eye, V2 feeds the upper mouth, V3 feeds the jaw. That's um, pretty big. There's a, um, a phenomenon called the RAS sy sy uh, system, um, it's an alarm system within the brainstem. 
that can be put into a vicious cycle through teeth clenching. So if you're really anxious, um, you're worried about something and you're, clam you're clamping down on that jaw, it alarms that brain stem and can put you into that vicious cycle. So talking about those teeth grinders, people having a hard time finding an airway, um, getting stuck in this anxiety type vicious loop, it could be um, a trigeminal issue and a jaw issue. So those could be two things that you could go and treat individually. Another interesting piece is that it communicates with C1 through C3. So you're talking about those cervicogenic headaches not necessarily just coming from tight muscles of the neck, that RAS symptom may be heightening that C1 through C3, so by treating trigeminal, you could actually affect the cervical spine. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about trigeminal neuralgia. So when a dentist comes in to numb your jaw, they may actually put the lidocaine right here on this trigeminal nerve so that your teeth are now numb. Well, if they damage that trigeminal nerve, you may have permanent loss of sensation at that jaw. You may lose some control of those facial muscles. So by going back and treating, maybe there's some scarring that's holding that trigeminal nerve and not allowing it to floss in and out of position, or it's stuck within that dural sheath that we talked about. Um, that could be an easy thing that you could go and try to treat to help with trigeminal neuralgia. Abducens. Uh, also passes through um, the sphenoid. Um, it runs through the cella tersica and also this petrous ridge. Um, and it has a lot to do with that orbit. It's a long nerve that's prone to injury. So here it is over here, this um, brownish gray, brownish gold wire. It's a long nerve that's prone to injury. Look for someone that has to turn their head to correct their eye position. So they're turning their head to try to straighten out their eye position because it's probably adducted in. Facial nerve, so it's this blue nerve exiting back here behind the mastoid. Um, it does all of your facial expression. It also feeds that lacrimal gland for tearing, um, that nasal mucosa. It communicates big time with your vagus nerve, which is down here at a jugular foramen, your olfactory, glossal pharyngeal. Um, this is also where Bell's palsy lives. Um, there's something called uh, Ramsay-Hunt syndrome, um, loss of taste, loss of the blink reflex. Um, some of those kids who come in that have a, a nervous tick or a spasm, it may be living in facial nerve, not necessarily just the brain. There's something called crocodile tear syndrome. I've never seen it, but it's where this, if this nerve is damaged and it regrows and it really grows into this lacrimal gland over here, they will get intense tearing with eating and drinking. This is a pretty big one, especially when you go back to look at some of those retained primitive nerve reflexes that we're gonna talk about, is the inability to block out background noise um, also has to do with facial nerve and that communication with vestibular cochlear, which is our next nerve. Vestibular cochlear is actually two nerves wrapped in one sheath, and it's this blue and red wire that's wrapped, and it actually enters through the petrous ridge and I don't have an inner ear model, but if you were to open up the inner ear, they all go their own direction once they get within the inner ear. So you're talking about balance, uh, orientation to space, as well as hearing. Um, those semicircular canals uh, innervates all of those, so you're knowing if you're standing, laying down, or if you're turning. Um, it also communicates with your cerebellum, your thalamus, and your feet. It also communicates with the facial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, this gold nerve again, and your TMJ, basically because of that TMJ position right there on the temporal bone. Glossal pharyngeal uh, passes through the petrous ridge and then out this jugular foramen that we've talked about before. It's responsible for the gag reflex, the majority of the sensation of your tongue, posterior tongue for bitter and sour. Accessory nerve is the only nerve that starts outside the cranium and then goes to the brain. It starts on your upper f uh, five cervicals, then it enters through foramen magnum, communicates with the brain, and then it comes back out jugular foramen. So you could see how a neck injury could greatly an impact your um, accessory nerve. And I would go to argue that a lot of people that come in that have chronic neck pain 
chronic spasming of their neck have probably damaged this nerve in some way and cranial would be a huge bang for their buck um, in treating that. Um, and last one's hypoglossal. That's your swallowing nerve, um, speech, eating, sucking. This is a huge one with infants, especially if they had a tough delivery, um, working that jaw position, making sure that jugular foramen is open. Um, the jugular foramen, really accessory is the big one there. You've got most of your fascial connection here that comes down um, the system. And then we're gonna go over those three gut-brain connection uh, positions with Vegas when we do our demonstration.